you could use it as a segue into explaining your technology tree. What is it that you work on? What is it a long-term goal for your field and what um, are bits that other people can help with? Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you yeah, so much for the kind words and the nice introduction. It's really great to be here. Um, yeah, so I guess as a, a way of uh, transitioning, um, when people talk about technologies that can actually aid cooperation or international cooperation, it seems like a lot of people in the sort of futurist or forward-looking technology space focus on blockchain. Um, I think it's possible, though, that um, AI machine learning is you know, perhaps even more significant to the future of cooperation and sometimes um, doesn't receive as much attention from that angle as opposed to other implications of AI. Um, so this isn't something that I work on that much per se, but I thought it might still be interesting to talk about. There's this general idea of cooperative AI. Um, probably the person who's most associated with the, the idea is um, a colleague of mine, Alan Defoe, um, who has a recent paper, Open Problems in, Cooperation in Cooperative AI, that people might want to check out. Um, I'll talk about like a specific area where we can imagine AI, or not very specific, but an area we can imagine AI helping with in the future. Um, so basically, international conflict is obviously something that um, almost no one likes. Um, typically, when a war happens, uh, almost no one is very thrilled about this, or if there's an arms buildup, uh, typically this is it's, you know, not necessarily the, the best possible outcome. Um, and one really simple way of making this point is any time that you have, let's say, a war, um, almost always it would be better for everyone involved if you had the same you know, political settlement or outcome just without the war, war. stage of it. Um, and similarly for, you know, arms buildups or developing a nuclear weapons program or anything that's sort of costly, typically anything like this that involves risk or damage or death, um, it's, you know, not Pareto optimal or it's mutually negative compared to some possible arrangement that wouldn't involve these things. Um, and so it's a major topic in, you know, international relations theory of why does all this bad stuff happen that no one wants. Um, and, you know, one simple answer is a lot of it comes down to institutional dysfunction or bias or rationality. But above and beyond that, there's also structural reasons why it's really hard to avoid at the international level um, arrangements or advance that no one wants. Um, and a couple of things that are pretty important. Uh, so one thing that's pretty important is often people or like international actors have really substantial disagreements about the likely outcomes of conflicts or the intentions of different actors or just relevant facts about the world that influence what you know, makes sense, what doesn't. So most wars that happen, both sides think that it's more likely than not that they'll win. That's not universally true, but it's pretty common, which implies that they're they have sort of inconsistent beliefs about the world, or there can be inconsistent beliefs about, you know, what's going on with Iraq's, you know, weapon, you know, WMD programs, um, or, you know, does a state have aggressive intentions or things like that. And some of the reason why um, these sort of information asymmetries persist um, is that um, it's really, really hard for actors to make themselves transparent about facts which are relevant to coming to agreements without also making themselves vulnerable in certain ways. So maybe you want to allow in arms inspectors, but you also don't want them to get access to information that would weaken your security. Um, or, you know, in principle, maybe it'd be great if you don't have aggressive intentions to allow someone to just hang out, you know, in, um, you know, your, uh, um, you know, like in the Oval Office or in DOD or something like that, listen to conversations, figure out what intentions are and go, okay, you know, no, nothing to be concerned about here. But also obviously that would leak a huge amount of information that you don't want to, to otherwise give away. Um, and just a really, really major issue here is you, in principle, if you had a completely trustworthy human inspector who could, let's say, you know, inspect all weapons facilities, sit in on all meetings of your political leaders and things like this, um, then it would resolve a lot of the issue, but you can't trust that perfectly a person that actually, you know, not leak this information. Um, and so something that's interesting about machine learning is it seems like in principle, if you could automate some of the stuff that you might want an idealized arms inspector or be a mediator or someone like this to do, um, in principle, it could conceivably be a lot more trustworthy than any person. Um, so you could design a system such that its behavior um, is actually reliably of a certain type or doesn't leak information. Um, and also, you know, that's like reliably accurate in its outputs. So it, as one analogy, like a bomb sniffing dog is sort of a piece of technology that performs this classification task. Like does a, a bag have a bomb in it? You know, it gives out this one bit of information. Does it probably have a bomb or does it not probably have a bomb? Um, but really reliably, a bomb sniffing dog is not going to leak any other information about this. It's not going to say like other stuff that's in the bag. Um, and if you could have like a bomb sniffing dog for things like, you know, is this, you know, is someone planning to build a nuclear weapon? Does the state invade, plan to invade this other territory? You know, things like that. Um, then in principle, that seems like that could be really useful for reducing certain risk factors for conflict. Like certainly not removing the risk of conflict due to the existence of rationality, et cetera, commitment problems. But um, in principle, if you could automate using machine learning, lots of stuff that you would ideally want an inspector or a mediator to do as a human, um, this might be something that helps a lot with reducing the risk of international conflict. 
Lovely. Yeah, we just had uh, Georgius from Open Mind as well, uh, speaking a little bit about selective transparency. And I think that's always like a really, it's a certainly an undervalued issue that also relies obviously uh, a lot on the CK word uh, that we just discussed. Okay, Matthias, uh, what about yours? Give us a little bit of a glimpse in your technology tree. And all of you guys, if you have questions, comments, raise your hand. Uh, okay, uh, uh, is, is it on? Yes. Yes. Okay. So uh, yeah. So basically, what I am is uh, so I'm sort of interested in theoretical computer science, which uh, basically means uh, I'm interested in what sort of things uh, you can do with computers and what sorts of things you can do that maybe nobody has sort of thought of yet, uh, which made it a little bit of a challenge to sort of impose that on this on this <laughs> form. Uh, but uh, in general, for me, that that sort of means so the kind of things I'm interested in. So for example, is sort of things like sort of quantum theory of information. So. Um, you know, it has been sort of a discovery of like, uh, well, there's been a lot of research during the last um, 35 years, I suppose, into what exactly one can sort of do with quantum systems in terms of uh, like processing information, and there's like a lot of things that are sort of sort of unclear about that. Um, at the moment, there are also a lot of things about sort of machine learning and AI, and there are all kinds of questions about like, you know, what are the capabilities of these systems? Um, and like, you know, what sorts of things they, you know, are, are capable of doing. And finally, there's sort of like a much older sort of classical thing, which is to sort of, you know, the types of questions about like what, what you can or can't compute, or like how fast you can sort of do it. Um, and like in terms of the, the, the key challenge that I'm like personally most interested in is, is sort of like sort of understand sort of how sort of unpredictable or like sort of autonomous pieces of software could kind of come into existence, sort of relate this to perhaps what has been sort of talked about before, right? So uh, like a lot of people, uh, well, a number of people here are concerned about like AI risk. So the, the whole idea is, okay, maybe one day, you know, we accidentally create a piece of software that sort of uh, outsmarts us and takes over the world. And uh, an interesting question is, okay, so, you know, when we flip the on switch, what is the story we will be telling ourselves about like what that piece of software would be doing? Um, and, it's, and it's very interesting because like there are not, for, for the vast majority of like you know computer programs you might write, like if you imagine something like um, something that just like generates all possible proofs. Now there is a lot you can predict about that system. You don't know what it will prove, what it won't prove, when it will do it, but you know you know that it won't be generating cat pictures in ever greater resolutions. You know a thousand years from now, um, and so uh, uh, it is ever interesting to think about how far one can sort of push this sort of. Uh, how, how, how basically programs where you basically cannot tell anything at all by the book. So very briefly, that's, that's... Wow, okay, that's that's quite the ways out. Uh, and I remember, um, so Kvati has also joined us as a 20, uh, 22 Foresight Fellow, and I remember a senior application, you were first with David Deutsch, and now with Scott Aronson, and that I think just having, having like, yeah, I think spending time with both of these, I'm like so thrilled what's gonna come, what's gonna come uh, out from your direction in the next year. Very, very, very excited about it. And I think, you know, what you mentioned is a very good, uh, also, um, uh, yeah, also a dilute to, to uh, Jan, for you discussing a little bit on what it is that you're working on, what is an exciting end goal for your field, where do you think we could be going? Right, thanks. Well, maybe in a nutshell, we're trying to build the systems that you can play around with in the end, because, so we built quantum hardware, quantum computers, and the thing with quantum is that it's, you cannot use the classical processors, you can use it to simulate them, but you will very quickly run into memory and other limitations. So you really need the quantum systems to play around with. And that's exciting, but also a challenge. Um, I think when I was looking at your slide, the interesting thing is that I also have AI somewhere at the bottom. Who doesn't? Uh, but <laughs> you, you also had it in both of the boxes. But the way I see it, I have this feedback loop. I don't know if you can see the, the error there. Um, because I see it very much, what we have seen in classical computing is actually that the development of chips was used, these chips were then used to improve again the next generation of, of chips. So it was this kind of self amplifying process. And this is a little bit how I see it with quantum and AI, because you can use AI to improve the, let's say, operation of quantum processors, to stabilize them, do all of this, and then maybe create better AI, whatever um, algorithms or so, um, and then feedback this in. So this is kind of how I see the worlds um, coming together there. Um, but then there are many challenges, of course, still to solve on the, on the quantum side. I cannot even read my own. Writing. So um, anyways, um, we, we need fundamental quantum physics um, and I think a lot of science still needs to be done and this is something that's also very important for me um, to push this uh, field of, of science still and educate also. I think education is very important here and then bring it together with a, let's say, high performance classical computing and create this kind of hybrid, hybrid nodes, hybrid um, computing. And the end goal, goal that I uh, stated there is a quantum internet. 
So when people talk about quantum, often they only kind of associate quantum computing with it, but actually there are more pillars in the, in the game. There's quantum communication. Um, some folks are already using satellites in the orbit and they are communicating through quantum states with them. And um, there are quantum sensors um, out there for better, I don't know, you can, for example, make images of your, your brain activities with certain superconducting circuits. So there's a lot of kind of quantum world out there and connect all of these dots together. I think this is kind of the grand goal uh, for the community. Um, what do I have there as a challenge? Okay, something that is still missing, um, especially if you look at it from a computer science point of view, is a quantum memory. So the way these processors work at the moment is very much like FPGAs work, kind of a real-time thing. You run through the algorithm at once, but it's very tough to kind of store a certain state in, for some time and then kind of bring it back. So this kind of memory is, is still missing, and I think this is, I don't know what you think about it, but for me this seems like a big limitation um, for the kind of flexibility all of this and I would love to see someone kind of building a quantum memory that works on the chip to accelerate everything. Wow, that's a big ask. Anyone, any ideas already? Oh, yeah, Pauli, build us a quantum memory, will you? <laughs> yes, so we talk about quantum um, in general and the fact that enable a lot of AI progress and uh, even other large te technological um, progress. So that's very exciting. And I'm curious about your thoughts on um, how we could uh, potentially regulate those because um, because it could be very powerful. So the regulation of uh, quantum technology, I'm curious about your thoughts. And whether you think it could be dangerous or not, but whether it could enable actors to have very powerful Thank you, yeah, That's actually an excellent point because I was focusing a lot of technology on the technology itself, but quantum has this strategic aspects because certain algorithms can be used maybe to um, uh, break some encryption codes that are out there or so. And this is why also it's very relevant for politicians and they try to understand it. And um, in terms of regulations, for example, there's something that's called the Vassana arrangement. I don't know how I'm familiar with this. It's kind of a list of kind of technology where certain member states who kind of um, agree on this um, regulate technology for dual use purposes. And um, this is being discussed on an annual or biannual um, base, for example. And this year, the, the last meeting was just, I think, in October. In Wassenaar is uh, somewhere in the, in the Netherlands. It's where the US embassy is in the Netherlands. This is what it's called, the Wassenaar arrangement. They meet there and they agree on this list. And this year, for the first time, quantum was kind of being discussed. Um, and the way they approached it was a little bit, to my surprise, not so much from the use case perspective, um, like you said, AI or, or whatever, but they really thought about kind of what hardware can enable these use cases. And they had a certain criteria, which is the number of qubits, so the number of kind of computational elements on the chip, which they want to regulate and every, all the technology that is related to this. So it is getting there, but from my perspective, from the wrong direction, because I would love to see it coming more from the use cases because dual use, as it's kind of, the word says, it's about the use and not so much about the technology, but that's only my opinion. Thank you, lovely. And we have one more tech tree here from as well, another 2022 Fawcett Fellow. Thank you so, so much for coming, Tom. Uh, I, I would just remember Mark speaking very, very fondly of you, which is, I think, the strongest signal that, <laughs> that, that I usually <laughs> operate by. Mark Muller is one of our Fawcett Senior Fellows and I really um, uh, and like nominated uh, t Tom for the fellowship and you co-published together and so forth. So very, very excited to hear a little bit more about your technology treatment. Thanks a lot, Alison. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. I'm Tom. Um, so uh, indeed, I did work with Mark in the, in the, in the, in the past uh, on uh, smart contracts and improving JavaScript. And actually, that's a, sort of a segue into, into my, the topic I will talk about today, which is I've always been very passionate about creating software. Uh, designing programming languages, new languages, and thinking about how can we write software more effectively. And in recent years, I've, it's, you know, it's been becoming more and more clear that AI is going to be a key technology to help us write code more effectively. Um, and so, so I work in this field called AI pair programming or artificial intelligent programmers. Um, very exciting field because I think sort of an ambitious end goal for it is to achieve what I would call code literacy. So if you think about human literacy, the fact that we all learn to read and write and what effect that has had on our civilization, 
if you would extrapolate from that and think about what would a civilization be where each and every one person is able to instruct a machine and program it and, and do its bidding, automate any possible task you can imagine, I think that would be a huge force multiplier uh, for future scientific discovery. And so AI pair programming these days, what, what, what are sort of some of the enabling technologies? Well, I, I guess a lot of you have heard of uh, deep learning, uh, the, the sort of uh, AI models that can now generate text, generate images like generative AI. Uh, maybe you've heard of models like GPT-3. These are like very, very large scale uh, neural systems uh, that are actually able to sort of autocomplete uh, text, autocomplete code, autocomplete images. Um, so that's a key enabling technology that is sort of uh, not quite there yet, but but really sort of you can you can see it coming. Um, I mean, ultimately, what these things are is just uh, giant uh, probabilistic models that try to just predict based on uh, you know purely the probability of seeing a next token based on the prior tokens. Um, and so the other thing that's happened, of course, is a tremendous uh, rise in, in, in compute that enables us to train these models at scale. So there's the scaling law similar to sort of Moore's law that holds for these neural models where you say, as you increase the training data, as you increase the model size, the, so they, they just keep becoming better and better at predicting uh, the text. And so uh, the other thing that's enabling this, and I don't think we've discussed this much yet, but I, I'm very excited about it, is this. Um, open source, which is kind of like a social technology, if you will, right? Like if you just imagine what has what open source has unlocked for humanity, like this this culture of sharing with one another all the projects that we're building, and you know each project building off of other projects. So that's amazing in its own right. Uh, but as a kind of interesting side effect, uh, these these open large open source code bases, like the entire the entirety of GitHub, can be used to actually train these AI pair programmers. Um, and the third thing uh, is what I call like a, the API economy. So that's the other thing. Um, so that is coming together. So we're, we're increasingly living in a world where every service you can imagine is uh, accessible through an API, right? If you think about, um, you know, uh, things like Uber, for instance, like you know, taxi rides be can become available through APIs and so on. So everything that we do in the world starts to become programmable. And I think that's that's going to open up some exciting paths. In particular, um, you know, one of the things that this will enable, um, if you think about traditional programmers, they they already use this kind of, they are augmented by their tool suite, like a compiler, right? Like a compiler will look at your code, it will verify it, it will type check it, and it'll try to make sure you didn't make mistakes. But what a traditional compiler can't do is reason about the intent you had when you wrote the code. And I think, for instance, many people here probably are familiar with the DAO and the DAO book, right? So in, in the crypto space, you had this uh, DAO, the, the original DAO, which had a bug in it um, that, that caused an attacker to drain uh, large amounts of money from the DAO. And so the problem there was like, you know, these are the kinds of bugs that, that traditional tool chains can't really uh, deal with yet because they're really not clear about the intent behind the code. And uh, so... If code becomes law, right, this is sort of the, the whole point of, of smart contracts or, or self-enforcing code, we really need to become much better in building bridges between human intent and what the code actually does. And I think that's, that's one exciting area. The other is, you know, um, what would you build if you were able to all of a sudden just write code by talking to a machine? If you could just use natural language to tell the machine, this is what I want to achieve, the thing comes up with a proposal, you can amend it. Like, what would you be able to do? And I would be very interested in, in picking up conversations on that. If you have thoughts on that, definitely something that I look forward to discussing. Maybe the final thing I want to note, and sort of echoing what Stuart said this morning, is uh, pointing out the hazards of these kinds of technologies. And so, because many people think, when you think about, okay, artificial general, general intelligence, think about models like GPT-3. They, they take text as input and they generate text or models that classify images very accurately. These models can't really harm us because all they do is classify images or generate text. But if you start thinking about AI models that generate code and then you execute that code, and I mentioned the API economy, right? Like imagine 
you know, uh, you know, the stock market is, is accessible through APIs, right? Like what if you let loose AI systems that generate instructions that you then run on the world's APIs that can potentially cause severe damage. So that's really a hazard that we need to take into account when we build these kinds of systems. So I would say echoing Stuart's words, you know, solving for robust AI, AI safety is a critical thing that we need to solve before, you know, building these systems. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions? Um, we have one here already. Do you want to make a comment on the robust AI nodes? Um, uh, I maybe go the qu okay. questions. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Max, uh, if you want to come to the front, grab a mic. Perfect. Thank you. Um, very great to actually have experts on AI, crypto, and quantum sitting <laughs> I know. <laughs> I always wonder it's like you have very strong synergies between quantum computing and AI. But as our quantum computing guy just mentioned, quantum computing can also be used to hack encryptions or make them less valuable. Crypto is very depending on encryption. So is there actually a future where AI and crypto can kind of coexist or will quantum computing just massively push AI and accelerate it but kind of just make crypto invaluable because it can just hack all encryptions? Lots of speculation there for you guys. Yes. Um, I, 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 are, you, I, are you friends or foes? <laughs> Doing the same. No, so, I mean, one, one thing about, um, because I get asked that a lot about like blockchain systems, like, you know, for instance, Bitcoin, what if quantum comes of age? Won't we, you know, be able to reverse engineer SHA-256? And I think the answer to that is always, these are living technologies, right? So as other technologies make progress, we will see the blockchain systems, for instance, adapt their hash algorithms or whatever they do. And I'm pretty sure, you know, once you come up with quantum algorithms that break the encryption, you will also have quantum algorithms that come up with even stronger encryption, uh, encryption schemes. So you really need to look at it as dynamic systems and a sort of arms race that's going to build up and not so much as you know, you have static systems today, and once they're broken, you know, they, they, they remain broken. They will adapt. That's that's at least my belief. I can, or just one, Great. Just one short comment, yeah. because it was also mentioned, this all encryption schemes. I think it's important to understand that quantum will not break all encryption schemes, and there are so-called quantum-safe um, algorithms. Oh. So it's more like a timing question. How, how long does your organization need to change from, let's say, some asymmetric code to something that's quantum-safe? So, And how much money are you willing to invest in this? Um, yeah, I was just going to say the same thing that, um, there are already like algorithms have been developed that people are pretty confident are safe against quantum computers. Um, so it'll probably be a transition problem as opposed to something that's like a, you know, stuff has been fundamentally broken. Just people need to transition to different algorithms. It'll be a bit costly, but it will be, you know, finally break it. And do you have any uh, aspect on the, the safety and, and, and governance of this? Uh, I think you spoke briefly on the AI part, but it's like the quantum issue puts out a few at all, or this my contact in bit. Um, yeah, I think I'm not that concerned from a safety perspective about quantum computing. So at least on the cryptography thing, I do think that people are on track to transition to quantum safe algorithms. Um, it might be the case that stuff that was encrypted on um, using existing schemes, you know, there could be some security issues, even if it's broken and it's like five years out of date. Um, but I would be surprised if there's a really huge issue just because people are aware of these problems. Um, um, I'm not that familiar with um, like, I guess sometimes in how there's suggestions that quantum computing can really substantially speed up machine learning progress. I actually don't know that much about that claim. I don't think I've really seen a very strong argument for it. So it might be the case that quantum computers will have AI related security issues, but um, it's, um, at least I'm not confident that that's the case and it doesn't seem at least yet obvious. Oh, well, but definitely much interdisciplinary along the horizon. Do you want to make a final comment, Matthias? Oh, they have addressed them. <laughs> All right, well, I can't believe that we're we're just getting to lunch and we've covered all the bits of the parade from space to neurotech to crypto covers, web three, privacy preserving technologies, all the way out to quantum computing and AI. Thank you so, so much.